we're, we're here for what's the ROI of UX. But let's go over a little bit about me to begin with. I'm originally from London, now based in Sydney. I've led design teams, UX teams, CX teams, and strategy teams in both London and Sydney. I've worked both client side and agency side. <clears throat> and for me, they both do it. Both have their ups and they have their downs. My career has touched on a range of industries from travel to automotive, and it even was lucky enough to work on the 2012 Olympic campaign, which was in London. Two notable roles in the CX role for me has been in the digital transformation piece for two of Australia's iconic brands, one being Qantas and the other being Optus. So in those, in those roles, you've got to engage very heavily with your stakeholders. How, however, what I'd say is I'm a huge advocate of human-centered design and I always believe placing the customer at the center of the design process. So for all sense and purposes of this talk, the customer in this UX talk is your stakeholders. So a well design, I'm a sneak freak, um, but admittedly, only Adidas, that's the only ones I wear. <laughs> I like traditional Japanese tattoos, single malt whiskeys, street art, like going to gym, so like going to gigs and hitting the gym to blow up some steam. And I would say you should do all that fun stuff before COVID-19 took hold. Okay, so that, what, that elephant has now left the room. Uh, we can crack on with some of this. So once again, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing your time with me to go through this. So without further ado, we will crack on. So. The agenda for today is what is the return of investment on UX? It's how to prove it, how to approach it with stakeholders, and what identify what to measure. So let's jump into it. What exactly is the investment on UX? So when we look at this, there's many facets to UX, but when it comes to return on investment, it's one that's probably not touched on as much as it should be. So if you look at the dictionary definition of, of return of investment, and strap in, because it's a measurement is an analytical exercise to help you understand the relative importance of design projects, or of, of design. However, in simple English, what that equates to is time, how to save it, money, how to, how, to, how to generate, how to get growth, or how to avoid um, loss, and effort in how to reduce that part of it. So, being perfectly blunt, the return on investment affects the bottom line, and that will equate to dollars. However, it will always come to us. So where return of investment um, will hit, so there's, there's, there's six key areas of the business where this is impertinent. So it's with revenue, with customer retention, with, pre, with team productivity, support costs, development costs, and development time. So these, those are all facets of it, and all those in some shape and form will kind of touch on throughout the talk. So the big question is, how do, you prove, how do you prove it? Well, first of all, how do, you, how do you prove to the business that they should invest in UX? You may have heard of this following quote, that every dollar invested in ease of use returns between 10 to $100. That's US dollars, by the way. However, that quote is from my and it's based on their metrics and their methodology and their research. However, this quote has been attributed to quite a few other industries and brands. However, I want to use that as a, as a marker in the sand that once you actually look at your return of investment, it can probably gain as much as per one, um, for one dollar spent. 
Okay, that's great. However, let's look at some numbers and give examples for this. And these are industry wide. These are industry wide. So hundreds. That's it costs. The cost of fixing an error after the development is a hundred times more than fixing the error before the project is completed. And up to 50% of developers' time is spent on avoidable rework. So from these numbers, what we know, if we look at X, the get go, then a lot of these costs will be avoided. And these, these numbers can boil back down to productivity and work in on the, on, the, on the right problems. Time saved could be spent on better initiatives, could be looked at, um, looking at better problems to solve for. And what that gives us back is to you get that time back to work on more meaningful work as well. Okay, some more numbers. Um, there will be a few in this talk. Here's a talk on return of investment. So. Hopefully there aren't any numerophobics out there. So some numbers to um, take into account here is with 16%, this is from a report from Foresters. This was produced in 2016. And what I'll do, there's, there's some talking points on these slides and I will publish these slides with the links to these resources as well. So if people want to um, dive a bit more into details of, of these topics, then I will, I will have that hand for people to, do, to be able to do that. And also, when questions come in, if there's something which is really pertinent, which I have answers to, I will do an update version of, of this deck. So, companies that invest in UX, ex, um, they find that 16% of customers are significant, significantly more likely to remain with that same brand. 17 are more likely to recommend that product or service to their friends, to families, and to colleagues. Now, a big number here is 14% of people, that increases their willingness to pay for a premium product. What I would add to this, this is across the industry, so this is the average. Once you actually look at, on the, if you go down a level, when you start looking at each individual industry, these numbers will differ, but this is, this is the collective as the average across industries. So if we look at that last one, 14% who are willing to pay a premium. Let's look at Spotify. Let's look at the Spotify model, for example. They have a free version. They play ads between the songs. And if you, if you want to listen to it ad free, completely fine. However, you have to pay your monthly premium, and that's for a, a, a subscription fee, which is 50 bucks. And you could, you could use the comparison of Netflix because they use that same business model as well. So 15 bucks is a relatively small fee. However, if you look at that 14%, that percentage is going to equate to a very large chunk of money. So you can show numbers to your organizations. You can show those previous numbers to your organizations. However, proving to, prove to your company actually what it means to them will be dependent on a few crucial questions. One of those would be the maturity level of, of the company, of the organization, could even be of the UX department. So there's a report by Design Better, which is um, a subsidiary of InVision. They produced a report called the New Design Frontier, which actually talks to the maturity levels of businesses and organizations. There's a link, there's a link in, the, um, in the notes, uh, which talks more to that. So some of the other questions could be, does the organization know the value of the return on investment? So a couple of more questions for that would be, what, what are the barriers? What are they? Where are they coming from? Who do you need to convince? Is there anyone else you need to influence within that organization? Um, more questions could be, is UX gonna save the business money? Or is it gonna generate more money? How will UX achieve this? 
Is it going to persuade people to buy more? Or is it going to be done by reducing errors? So there's a, there's a range of questions that, that comes to mind that the organization um, should be answering or I would encourage um, you guys to actually ask these questions. So if, we, if one of the questions is, uh, is UX going to help them decide to buy faster? So, and to, to what point are they doing this? So, what I'll talk to for this is, this is a real life, this is a real life case study, and it's based on getting customers to buy faster. And this is based on Macy's, which is an American e-com site. So, when it comes to a significant return of investment, this is UX folklore. If, let's look at the continuous guest button. So with that call to action, experiment by Jared Bull. He's an author, podcaster, educationer, speaker. Um, he now runs the educational units called Center Center in America. So he had a hypothesis which was, if a continuous guest button was created, just how much revenue would be affected by, by the introduction of this button. So what I'll do is I want you UX folk out there to take a minute to think about how much money was generated by the introduction of this. Take a minute to think about it. Hold that number in your head. So have a think about just in a, in a single year, how much do you think was attributed to this component? How much revenue was, was generated? Just think, just think of a number. So whilst that's in your head bubbling away, many people have seen this. This, this button is ubiquitous, seen across many e-com sites, um, especially fashion. That's where, that's where you'll, you'll see quite a few of these ones popping up. But what I'd say to you, uh, whilst you're thinking of this number in your head, when, you, when you've actually gone online to buy something and you've stopped and you've not made the purchase due to having to create yet another new login, another new account, how many times have you stopped yourself from doing that? If the answer is yes, even if it's just once, it's still a yes. You, you not going ahead of it has cost that firm, has cost that business um, another sale. So with, these, with, these call to action, with this call to action, having to create another, another account, another register, to register another, uh, yeah, another use, sorry, another user, um, that, is, that is a barrier. So whilst you have that number in your head, um, I want you guys to go to the comments. So if you, if Dan can put the uh, the, the chats um, URL in again, so you guys have that. So you go to the comments. You've got his number in your head. How much do you think? How much revenue do you think was generated by the introduction of this continuous guest button? Do it now. Um, and while I say this is a quiz. I have an audible credit to give to the first person picked closest to that number. Um, yeah, do it now, no cheating. Uh, by the way, I'm not sponsored by Audible at all. It's just a way to get, just the way to inject a bit of humor, a bit of interactivity into this. And I'm feeling a little bit generous. Okay, so whilst that number's in your head, and hopefully you've, you've, put, you've put a number in the, in the, question, in the comment fields, how many of you were close to this figure? So if your answer was in around $300 million, US dollars, I should, I should hasten to add there, you'll be right on the money, so to speak. So this is called the $300 million button. And Jared Spill has written an article about this, and that article has spawned numerous articles off that as well. In Medium, um, Luke Robowski, has written about it. 
it appears on numerous um, discussion panels as well and research papers. Um, so with Jared Spool, he, uh, he tells a story and he's been dining out on this ever since. And who can blame him? Because as you can agree, a $300 million return is not too bad on return of investment of, uh, of UX. Okay, just, had, just putting in this for a um, bit, bit, for, bit for giggles. So yes, I admit, I'm a bit of a Jerry Spool fanboy. He, was, he came to Sydney um, to do Sydney Design Thinking. This was, way, this was back in November last year. It's a very good presentation. He's a great speaker. There's a link to that. It goes for just over an hour. I would encourage you guys to, to dip into to that talk as well. Okay, moving on, let's get back on track. We're talking about the return of investment on UX. So, more questions from this. What does your organization care about? Um, what is important to them? What are the metrics that everyone cares about? Not just, not just uh, the design team, but everyone within the organization. What I'd say is you need to prove to the company that return of investment is something that should be concentrated on. So you need to do your homework. You need to pick something that resonates. This is a doing task. So you need to pick something that resonates with the company. You may want to start small or on a side project, but you need to pick one that the stakeholders care about. They're not going to be interested in, unless it's, a mass, unless it's going to encourage growth and drive revenue, but you need to have something that's tangible, something that they, they care about greatly. So you need to do this from data that you can obtain. Also, you'll need to ensure that it can be done without overloading your team and it can be done in a nimble, fluid fashion. But you'll need data for that. So you need to make friends or you need to make friends with, the, with your analytics team or you need to understand G, um, Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics, but you, you will need that data. So from that you obtain, you can create your return on investment of UX, but this needs to be clear. What I would say is that the figures, you, the figures you have, they can be estimates. Nothing at this stage has to be cast in stone. They can be estimates. However, you've got to ask yourself, what problems are you trying to solve? What does, what does, design, what does design do? Does it save money? Does it make money? Does it save time? Does it save effort? You need to arm yourself with the data and basically go and get to work. So as, uh, as an example, I used to work on the Toyota platform and I had identified, so online forms is a massive part of their ecosystem and something the stakeholders cared greatly about because that was their window of opportunity to engage with customers who would then go on to the dealerships and, and hopefully buy a total of the forecourt. So I had identified the Booker test drive as a form that wasn't converting as, as, as well as it should. So I had identified that there was a 56% abandonment rate on that form. So through, that, through the data, I discovered where customers had abandoned. People had started the form, but they'd failed to complete it. There, there were far too many fields, and the data had identified this. So I spoke to customers, I created a short survey. I know, a form within a form, there's probably a joke in there somewhere. Um, people um, people had started the form, 
but I just wanted to find out where they were falling off and why they weren't continuing. So I formed a hypothesis and within that, the input fields were reduced by 50%. So it was only to show what was really critical at that point. So a lot of those text fields were removed because they were superfluous for what was um, needed at that point of that engagement, of that relationship. So when it, came, when it comes to booking a test drive, the most, input, the most important things was the customer's name, their contact details, their preferred method of contact, and the dealership that they wanted to test the car in. Other than that, there was, there was a, the type of car that they wanted to test drive, so the dealer was well aware, and hopefully they had the stock that the uh, customer could, uh, could go and, and use and on a given date. And on that form, there was the ability to add more cars if that was the desire of the, of the customer. So this form was A-B tested, and the new, design, the new design immediately saw an uplift in customers booking, booking a test drive. Obviously, this meant more customers going, going through Toyota's dealership. So again, this is what, five years ago, so this was pre being able to buy cars online, so old school. <laughs> um, through this form, it essentially drove up revenue for Toyota and the return on investment for this self-initiated project was around the 300,000 K mark, that's Australian dollars. And that was in the first three months. So with that little side, side project, the client was extremely happy. And then from there, we spoke about more projects. And when you, when you actually start showing the value of the return of investment on UX, you can build that trust and then you can start building out more projects, which is obviously can only be a good thing. So when it comes to return of investment, it, in very simple terms, this comes down to calculating um, the return of investment is basically converting units. Um, but keep this in mind, the return of investment is showing how the design impacts what the company cares about. So you need to keep that top of mind. So everyone's heard of Jeff Bezos. He has said, if you double the amount of experiments you do per year, you're going to double your inventiveness. So what I like about this is that he knows a thing or two about making money. Everyone knows that. So this essentially is the return on investment of UX. So if we kind of break this down, the inventiveness, that means winners. So all his experiments are based on, sorry, they're, they're all evidence-based outcomes. The, so this will lead to improved experiences. That's, a, that's your customer impact. And through that inventiveness, and through those experiments, that looks at the time implication. So you reduce, reducing time, looking at the money aspect of it. Are you saving money? Are you reducing costs? And the effort involved as well. So what we're talking here is about experimentation. However, that's a, experimentation, A-B testing, that's another talk within itself. But what I'd say, there's some very good reports and documents from the Harvard Business Review and usertesting.com and some other platforms, which, um, and optimize is another good one. So if you key to understand that part of it, there's some good resources out there for, for that. And again, I'll include, I'll include those in the, in the notes for this. So how, did, how to approach your stakeholders. So firstly, and one that's very, very important, is what can you do within your company? So what I'd say to this is, approach is how you would re your research. Use your qualitative 
Use your quantitative research methods. Treat your stakeholder. That is now your customer. Treat them in that same, in that same way. Again, we go back to what is the maturity level of, of that company or your UX department? Am I into change, organization, company, businesses, and UX department, but all sense of purposes, they all equate to the same thing. It's your stakeholder in, in some guise. Um, with this, maturity level of the company is, is a big one. You may be working in a large organization. You might have a small design team. It might be the case that you're a UX of one. Um, however, you still need to find out who you need to convince, who do you need to influence. So what I'd say is use your UX superpower. Everyone's got them. Everyone's got that. I wouldn't even say hidden. It is a very exposed superpower. Everyone's got that empathy. So I'll touch on this a, a bit later in the, in the talk, but when you're treating your stakeholder as you would a customer, do what you do in your research. Use the same language as them. Use language that they understand. So Don Norman puts a nice point on this by saying UX professionals must learn to articulate UX in the language of business. So Don Norman, obviously UX legend, author of books on psychology as, as well as usability, one of the key members in the NN group. And I would hope that people are aware of that group. If you don't, jump onto that. That's a great source of resource and research. And um, so they do articles and videos, great source and inspiration as well. However, what I would say when it comes to talking that language, talking, talking that business language, you do need someone who is willing to listen. There's no point having all this, all these questions and this knowledge and with no one to actually um, to talk to or to influence or convince. So you need someone who is willing to listen. You do need to find that champion. This kind of goes back to say, for instance, a Jeff Bezos, who's the CEO of a company. If everyone had a CEO who had that kind of viewpoint, that would that be uh, beneficial to everyone, um, everyone in the room. So you need to find that champion. You need to find that supporter. However, you do need to speak to them in the language that they understand. This comes down to forging friendships. And this, in this game, that's exactly what you're going to need. You need to reach out, you need to form those friendships. Once you form these friendships, form these alliances, use that social capital, because that will go a long way, believe me. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we're looking at the return of investment of the UX benefits, not only does this have impacts for the end user. And when I say end user, I do mean customer as in sense of customer as well as customer in the sense of your stakeholders as well. However, what I'd add is that there's no civil bullet to this. There's no one size fits all. The tools you'll need is arm yourself with questions. However, with those questions, you'll need to find the people with those answers. So what I am encouraging here is talk to people. UX isn't or shouldn't be a, a, a one-person sport. It should be a collaborative process. And this whole section, this whole part of UX needs everyone to be talking to each other. And so you, sh you should probably be one of the first people to start striking up those conversations. What I would say is that different, different scenarios, so questions will fit different scenarios for your different organization types, if it's um, and different platforms as well, because even if it's a case of you're an e-com site or your products, 
or your um, sustainability or environmental, it, it, again, it'll, it'll come down to the, to, the same, to the same notion. So what I'd say, speak to your stakeholders, encourage them, advise them of the benefits of, of the UX within this. However, with the RRI, this will affect the, the, the company. I mean, it affects, it affects the business as a whole, as ultimately it will save money. So when I say business, I'm talking about your business analysts, your developers, your testers, your Q&As, because as this, as this process reduces, um, as this process reduces internal time and effort, this ultimately is going to save the company money. So essentially, you'll build, you will be building an improved UX experience for the end user, which again, comes back down to more dollars, more growth for the company. However, I can't stress enough that this part of it should be baked into the process. This should be part and parcel of what, of what we're doing. So, with uh, what you need to do, so there's, a few, there's a few things within this, and if I just take them one at a time. So, have confidence. And when I say have confidence, basically you're relying on data. You're, this isn't your opinion. This is factual data. You're, you're, going, you're going back to the business with something tangible, something solid. So, have that confidence in, to present those numbers or to and present your, um, your rationale. Build trust, couldn't emphasize this more. So this is where you build your, your social trust. So everyone knows once you've done a bit of work and it's successful, the company, the organization, your stakeholders trust you even more and then give you a, a larger piece of, piece of the pie to, to look at all that will give you more projects or a, more, a bigger stake in, in your projects. So what comes with this as well is, is good stakeholder management. So what I'm talking to here is not just your, your hard skills, not just how you can design in Fig or how you can design in Miro or design in Sketch, any of those. We're talking about soft, your soft skills. So you need to brush up on those as well because this is, a, this is about... Um, being personable with people as well. And this comes to with forging alliances. Again, forging alliances, this comes with, not just within your design team, and again, touched on it previously, what the maturity level of your, of your organization. So how big is the design team? Is it wider than that? Do you sit in, within a consultancy? But you need to form those alliances. Find that champion, find that supporter, find that person who believes in what you're doing. Some people are lucky enough to have that within their grasp or within their companies already. And all I can say is like thumbs up and that's, that's, that's absolutely great. Um, lastly, use figures. So again, we're talking about return of investment. It will always come back down to numbers. So use your data, use your metrics. You can't argue numbers. Numbers don't lie. For instance, um, sorry, we go back to so with the forming alliances. As an example, when I was at Qantas working on a project, I really needed, and again, this was like one of those side ones. I really needed some key information from from a data from a data viewpoint. Now I've dug into Google Analytics a little bit. Can't say I'm an expert, far from it. However, I needed to find out more. So I reached out to the, the data lead and I just suggested, hey, how'd you fancy lunch? I'll pay. I, just, I have an idea. However, in order for me to form my rationale and build a, a good enough hypothesis, I actually need data to back up my points. And so went out for lunch. He, he was quite thrilled that I was reaching out and I wanted to find out more, um, which is great. So what I'd say is something like that is everyone in that, in that way will feel appreciated that you're trying to find out a bit more and you're respecting their craft as well. Um, and 
I'd even think about it reverse. If someone came to you to find out, again, with some people, UX is this big murky beast. They don't quite understand it. So if someone's to come to you, I mean, you'd be only too happy to express what you know, what you know about it and you'd be passionate about it. Hopefully you'd be passionate about it. Another key thing is to understand your stakeholders and your business goals. So you need to identify the metrics that actually align with those goals. Um, what I'd say to this, this isn't a solo exercise. Actually, a lot, if not the majority of this, is when you're looking at the return investment of UX, it's not just within UX bracket itself, it's, it's wider reaching. So this isn't a solo exercise. This is a collaborative exercise. This, this is it's a, it's a team sport. So what you need to do is you partner up with, again with the wider team and you can get others involved. I'll take you back to that previous example from, my, from being at Qantas. So from data analysts to product managers, when, when everyone gets into a room, Remember, more hands and more brains make light work. Or, yeah, do make light work. Let me say positive. They make light work. Um, and also, it's, it's, it's fun, it's engaging, and it's more productive. There's going to be better outcomes when there's more people involved than not. Well, let me quantify that. Having the right people can only be more productive. Another approach I would suggest um, is introduce lunch and learn sessions. Uh, you can host one. Many companies do lunch and learns. If your company organization doesn't do one, suggest one. Lunch, with lunch and learns, that there's been previous agencies I've been with and lunch and learn comes in as like during one of the seasons, they won't have it throughout the year. They'll have it for a certain, a certain time or even if you're working within a team setup. So if there's nine members in a team, you've got your designer, you've got your UXer, you've got your QA, you've got your business analyst, right through to every single principle within that makeup of the team. We had lunch and learn. So you do get to discover new things that you weren't aware of and again, as a team or as an organization, this can only, re this can only really help. Um, what, I, what I would say is that I would encourage this. Um, also, it's a way to discover what's going on in other parts of the business, if not, if not, not just your team. And it's a great way to bond. You build relationships and you, you're learning new stuff. Um, also, it's very informal. On one of the one of the agencies, <coughs> excuse me, one of the agencies I was at, um, the clients just come in particular days, and if we were showing something which was pertinent to them, and obviously had an effect or impact on their business, they'll be invited as well. So you can make it as informal as possible. However, what I would say with with this is that you need to be mindful of people's time because you are dealing with lunch. Well, you're dealing with lunch time and people are hungry. So remember to bring snacks. Um, bring cakes, candy to, to the Americans, sweets to us Brits, and lollies to, to you Aussies. Everyone likes a bit of a sugar rush, but you may want to put some savory things in there to, um, to start off with. Well, everyone's going to be pinging off the walls um, before you actually finish your um, talk. And with something like this, if you want to time box it, don't take up the whole lunch hour. Do it for half an hour. Do something really respectful of people's time and indulge them. And you can you get better engagement that way as well. What I'd say with this is just just do it. Once you've um, once you've worked out the problem you're trying to solve for, you need to you need to ensure that. It's not um, cost effective or there's any budget, budgetary requirements as well. Um, and we're just doing, take your project, make sure it's based on a solid foundation. 
and I would say it is easier to ask for forgiveness than to seek permission. But when you're doing this, make sure you've got data to back you up. You, this isn't opinion based, this is factual based. My old friend, Jared Spill. So again, when we're looking at the, the business side of, of UX, Jerry Spool said, one responsibility of the design leader is to demonstrate the value of design to the organization. So I saw, when I saw this quote, I, it resonated with me. I thought, that is absolutely spot on. Absolutely spot on. However, when I looked at it a bit further, I, I thought to myself, I agree in principle with what you're saying. However, I've just got one slight change to this. Now, I changed it to the responsibility of a design practitioner is to demonstrate the value of design to the organization. On this part, I think we're all in unison. We have this passion and it shouldn't be left on the, on the soldiers, sorry, the show, I can never say that word, the shoulders of leaders. This again is everyone in the team from, and again, if you're coming up to speed, if you're a newbie, um, obviously you need to understand the tools first of all and get, get that under your, get that in your, in your belt. Um, but every practitioner should be demonstrating the value of design. And again, should not be left on, this, on uh, should be left in the hands of the, of the leads in, in that respect. Um, because it's not just the lead that shows value, we all show value. So that should be coming from everyone. So the last quarter, we're, we're on the home straight. So identify what to measure. That's okay. So yeah, when you're identifying what to measure, um, what are the what are the sorry, what are the metrics that matter? What matters to the business? So Jeff Hol Holbeth from Human Factors has said a good user experience, like measurable return of investment, doesn't typically happen by accident. It's the result of careful planning, analysis, investment, and continuous improvement. So, once more, I'm emphasizing this is a team game. You're not, it's not golf, you're not playing, you're not, you're not there out in the fields by yourself. This is a team sport. One other thing that we work inside, again, I appreciate there are some practitioners out there who are working in a team of one. However, you need to, um, so I'd, I'd encourage to extend, extend that, um, that knowledge base or get in touch with the wider, get in touch with the wider business because that can only be helpful to them when they engage in that conversation and you're building relationships and you're forming those, um, you're forging those alliances as well. So I'd say reach out, talk, build relationships, because through those, we are better and the organization will be better. And off the back of that, whatever we produce should be better as well. So what will demonstrate an improvement in experience? Good question. So UX, UX, UX metrics will, they will demonstrate an improvement. So that numerical data will tell us something about the UX experience. So be that through surveys and questionnaires, qualitative, data, qualitative usability testing, analytics, or custom support. So some examples of UX metrics may be a satisfactory rating, uh, conversion rate, success rate, time on task. There's like, yeah, error states. There's a slew of, um, of, of metrics 
I mean, if I was to make a slide of what they were, it would just look like, um, well, please wait, it would look good. I'm, I'm not going to swear. It, it, it would look too, it wouldn't look too hot, put it that way. So this all comes down to, producti uh, to productivity and, and much, much more. So question, questions beyond that is, is UX going to save the company money? Is it going to help make money? So how is UX, how is it going to achieve this? Is it going to be by persuading people to buy more or by helping them decide to buy, to buy faster? And with that buy faster example, do you remember that $300 million button? That helps people buy things faster. So one, measure impacts. Benchmark your UX metrics before and after your design. So this is very key. So as I said, with the return on investment, it always comes down to numbers. So before and after your UX change, um, and to benchmark those, benchmark those metrics, there are different tools, different frameworks that you can use. I um, haven't suggested any within this talk. However, if you do want to know more about that, I can definitely get into a conversation around that. I mean, even how you output that benchmark can be done within a spreadsheet. It's, 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 it can be as convoluted or as easy as, as you see fit. But just remember to record those benchmarks and, and document them. Can't stress that enough. So what it comes down to is using UX orientated metrics. That makes the impact of your UX activities more objective. And with that, when you're losing that objective, it will definitely, it will it'll avoid stakeholders asking the question of the value of UX. It's like, do we really need it? Well, look at these numbers. These numbers do not lie. So again, talk to your stakeholders. You're, you're definitely going to need those UX metrics to help build that strong business case. And you'll need to show how that return of investment, how it impacts the, the top line, which is the all important one for the, for the company, but also what the bottom line is as well. Again, can't stress this enough, form relationships, talk, reach out. You're, you're not doing this by yourself. So on this, lastly, on with this one, what I'll just say, remember when you're measuring the value, so the business value of UX, sorry, of your UX efforts, it's important to be able to tie those results, <coughs> excuse me, to the revenue that the business earns as well. So this is what I'm saying. This isn't just you by yourself, number crunching. This is a team sport. But you just need to make sure you tie it back, you map it back to what the business earns, what it saves or loses through the conversion channel. Now, I know that's probably a specific task. So that, that might not apply to everyone who isn't working on e-coms. You might be um, working for a non-e-com -e site. So this practice of benchmarking is still pertinent to, to what we do. Number two, you need to convert that UX metric into a monetary amount. Um, with this, what I would say is when you're, <coughs> excuse me, when you're converting this, it will come down to money more times than not. However, it could save you, it could save you time. So if we take, uh, as an example, as uh, you talk to your stakeholder, and let's say you talk about, like say, so for instance, Spotify. So as an example, they have that 14 day trial period and it's from a free trial 
to a premium product or pay, yeah, premium payable product. So if we take that Spotify model, what would your UX metrics be in and around that? So let's just say over that 14 day period, what's your number of signups? What's the abandonment rate? Where did the purchase cycle end in that abandonment rate? Did people reach pay now or, or didn't they? Again, the data will tell you this. What is the satisfactory rating? So at the end of this exercise, as this, for the Spotify model as an example, the all important number at the end of this would be, what is the loss of revenue to the business for the people who didn't sign up to that premium product after, after the trial. Now, what I will add to this part is that sometimes it might not be the UX, it might be a cost factor. There may, there, there may be other, um, there, there might be other factors to this. So again, if, if there's a marketing department, this is where you trial and error, this is where you get a, B, testing it. So again, we're talking about the return of investment of UX. So there's different ways to, um, to go around this. Thirdly, you'll need to know that you have to convert those UX metrics into key performance, indica key performance indicators. So I'm sure many of you are aware of KPIs. It's not normally spoken within the creative circles or design circles, more so at that business level. But um, it'll come down to uh, it'll come down to KPIs. So what I'd, what I'd say with this, sorry, I'll just, just realise. With um, let me just skip back to the monetary amount. And I just need to touch on this. So it, it leaves with people with the, the right impact of what, what I'm suggesting around this is that when it comes to saving, um, saving time, so time is money, as we know. So we think of that time factor. Think about that $300 million button. Um, so again with this, to, to reiterate it again, is that the return of your investment is showing how design impacts what the company cares about. And arguably, what a, what a company cares about, again, from company to company, it will mean different things to different organizations, but it will come down to two factors, dollars and cents and customer satisfaction. So as we know from research, the research tells us that happy customers will spend more money. Sorry, back on to the, how converting the US metrics into your KPIs. So depending on what area your business um, or product UX is critical to, you'll need to drop your KPIs. And once again, team sport, you're not doing this in isolation. So once the KPIs have been detailed and defined, Capturing that data against, against each of them, you'll need to evaluate the outcomes and these outcomes becomes the basis of that return on investment calculation. So at this point, the calculation can still be estimates. So depending on how rigid you are, you'll, you'll need to um, relax a little bit and be comfortable in, in estimating However, have based that estimation on, on an anchor, then there, there has to be something you can, you can look at and research or come back to, to have a ballpark, or rather have a ballpark than not do this at all. Um, again, like I said, it doesn't have to be exact. It's not cast in stone. So an example of a KPI could be, let's say a 10% increase in conversions, for subscription service over a three month quarter. Again, looking at the Spotify model. However, if we were to look at this using the business terminology and using business language, you'd see was that conversion in Q3 or the third quarter. 
So again, can't stress this enough. This is very, very important to this part is that the, defining the KPIs is collaborative. It's an, it's an open discussion. Again, you're, you're reaching out, you're talking, this should not be done in isolation. This is a team game. Uh, what I would say is each part of the business will have differing KPIs, but just ensure you measure and you document what those KPIs are. Each KPI measurement or um, factor won't be for the whole team or the whole part of business. So you may need to, to categorize certain KPIs, but as long as that KPI is on the boards, you know what you're reaching for, that's what, that's what you're going to do. What I would say is just this part alone about converting UX metrics into the KPIs, I mean, this talk isn't long enough to go into the details of calculating the KPIs or the process of the prioritization the uh, drink of water. The prioritization, I think you all know what I mean by that, <laughs> um, as that's a talk in itself. And that's one for another day. So we're on the home stream. Great UX, and I realize I haven't spoken about UX as a principle, as a craft. However, I am from the understanding, everyone knows what it is. I don't have to define or, or frame what UX is. So let's just call it out. And I've said, great UX. Again, done in the right manner, following the right processes, right methodologies, this equals satisfied customers. Tick, that's your customer, that's your UX, that's your customer. Tick. So from the business angle, return of investment, now to this translates to your business value. And when I was looking at this, I kind of thought to myself, even with the return of investment, this could be seen from the very first experiment. If it's something your company isn't doing currently, if you show them a, a project, you're basing it on um, a bit of data or you're, you're basing it on a rationale or hypothesis, as soon as you show them that very first experiment, you're giving them an example of the return of investment. Of your, of your okay, so just quickly, let's recap. The return of investment, what have we spoken about? So what is the return of investment of UX? How to prove it? How to approach it with stakeholders? And identifying what to measure. So the key takeaways I would say from this is, if you're a UX practitioner, once you have the understanding of return of investment, this is gonna help you differentiate yourself from other designers and other practitioners because you're speaking the language of business. So you need to be comfortable with that. And it will, it's gonna open more doors as well. What are the metrics the business cares about. You need to set up your UX metrics for projects. You need to set up benchmarking frameworks, so framework. So there's a before and after effect, so people can see what the true value in your work is, and you've got something that they can, well, they they have to take notice of. You need to be collaborative. You need to build those alliances. It's to form um, relationships. You need to build up that social capital because that, that, that will go a long way. And as I said, this is this, this part of gear because this is a collaborative process. You should not be sitting in silo. Um, and again, there's other communities if you need to um, ask questions. I mean, UX Melbourne, UX Melbourne, oops, sorry, UX Brisbane is a prime example of that um, and also I, I firmly believe this and I can't emphasize this enough is that the return of investment it should be baked into the process because 
we're all, we, we all have these outputs and one of the outputs of what we do is to showing the value of that. And I think with these takeaways, you should be able to give a very, very compelling argument for the return of investment on UX. And I hope this kind of crystallizes the power that, you, that us UX folk have um, on, the, on that subject. And that's me done. So if there's any questions, I'm keen to find if there was any answers close to $300 million for that e-com site. Um, but yeah, that's me. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to me. My voice is a bit croaky, so hopefully survive that part of it. So I'll, I'll cut to, to Dan. And he will take over. Yeah, actually, I'll I'll be I'll be doing like the Q and A session. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Thank you so much for um, okay. sharing the knowledge on the return on investment of design. Cool. Thank you all who have um, joined in and listened to Thomas. Great um, sharing on return on investment. So here I got some questions um, for Thomas. First one that I have it was like from the chat in Zoom. So this was like living the numbers that you have shared in slides. Um, where did you get them? And can we get the links to those sources of metrics so that um, I guess the idea is to share it with the team on like maybe use it to build a case with those metrics as well. So yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I said, everything can be in that deck. Um, I might have to tidy up the, there's a couple more slides which have reference points on there. Mm -hmm. It might just be a couple of days, but all those reference points are on there because I want that file to kind of house everything. So if, they, if anyone needs further information, they can rely on that and go, and go back to it. Hmm. Awesome, awesome. Um, yep, so we got that. Um, Thomas to share those numbers. Next up I have from Johannes here. Besides cost reduction, can you think about examples of return on investment metrics for NGOs? For NGOs, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. So, as I said, I know this talk is kind of heavily pointed at the e comm side. So, with, with NGOs, in, my, in, in this talk, I do say my, at most times the UX metric is converted into a monetary amount. However, that could be a time saving amount as well. So if we look at it in terms of, if you've got a team, it's, the, it's what you're working on. It's what's a time-saving measure that you can, that you can um, encourage or actually put forward. So for instance, ways of working. If something isn't working in a fluid manner or the process is a bit broken and it has impact on your end user, how can, you, how can you affect that? How can you influence that? So again, what I'd say, it might not have that monetary factor or that kind of that dollar figure attached to it at the end of it, but it will, it will have a, a time or even an effort factor to it as well. It might be a case of, and I'm not saying people should reinvent the wheel or go in that, going for new platforms, but it might be a case of the way you might have an antiquated um, back end or platform you're using. There might be legacy issues. If that gets addressed, that's gonna, further down the line, that's going to have an impact on the customer. If, if there's a slow um, load speed for a page, because we, through research, we know that it takes well, 25 seconds for a person to pay because it's not loading. So there's those factors behind it as well. So. What I'd say is not, don't just think in the monetary um, amount, like the, the end dollar figure you're going to get at the end of it, but also in terms of reduced effort and reduced time. And that goes across, that goes across the business as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, may I add something here? Um, uh, actually, uh, the, the time reduction is also a cost reduction. So that's why I asked uh, beside that, because there is uh, something called the social ROI, where you, for example, 
uh, measure uh, education level or um, additional benefits? And can you think of uh, something about the UX uh, ROI that comes uh, with, uh, for example, uh, improving education for uh, specific nonprofit uh, measurements? So the social yes. Uh, ROI. Yeah, sure. What, um, what I would say to that is you can look at engagement levels. Has that person, if you come from an educator, the people you're in within that system, are they, what's their learning curve? Are, is everyone learning at the same pace? You can introduce a, satis, um, a customer satisfactory uh, metric to see are people satisfied with the speeds of learning, with how much they're learning, is it? advanced enough so there's a few factors that come in that come into play with that as well so what i would say is like each case will have its own um has its own nuances but you could you could you can definitely lend that model of return of investment to 99.9 percent .9 of things okay thank you okay cool oh. hopefully, hopefully that answered your question great stuff great stuff um, thank you, dear Johannes, for your question. Next up, I have here from Christina. Um, when everyone in different company areas or different titles advocates that they have the greatest ROI, how do you win besides getting <laughs> advocates? I'll wait just okay. a minute. Um, okay. One thing I'll pick straight away with this question, different titles. With Australia, and I'm not too sure if Australia has the trademark or the pattern for this, but they love a title here. Titles for me, I'm none fussed by titles. It's what's your role? What's, what, what are you doing for the company rather than title? Why are you here? What value are you adding? Um, and again, I think with this sort of question, you, there may be politics involved as well, especially as I say, with like this different company areas. Sometimes there are things or areas you can encourage and have a, uh, a bearing on or have an impression on, but sometimes it's beyond your role and your responsibility. I mean, there's been times I've worked, uh, um, I've worked with clients and because of the political battle that's in front of you, Sometimes you just have to say, okay, well, here's our rationale. Here's our hypothesis. This is going to work if you do X, Y, and Z. It's up to you guys to get your house in order for us to progress mm. forwards. So sometimes it's, some, it's, sometimes it's out of your control. And if it, if it is, it's, it's, rather than being defeatist, sit, how, can you make better of that, how can you make better of that situation? Um, mm. What, I, what I'd say is I'm a very positive person and I like to see the good before I see the bad. And there's been situations where I've joined a company or you, you learn a new part of the company and someone will say, oh, hey, watch out for this person here. They're not very helpful. But it's a case of you're judging it from your, your personal perspective and you're bringing that, you're projecting it onto that person. Me and this person haven't got that relationship um, how do I forge that relationship? So you, you're starting from a different place as well. Good stuff. Um, Christina, does that answer your oh, question? Oh, sorry, sorry, so yeah, so with yeah. Christina, what I'd say, um, what are they basing it on? Because for me, there's facts and there's opinions. Are they relying on data? Uh, have they talked to customers? Where, where, is, where is this knowledge, where is this belief coming from that they have the greatest return of investment? It's like, what are they, what are they showing you to prove, to prove that part of it? Yeah. Good and again, what's great about return of investment and this piece of, of UX is it's all factual. I mean, some of it is estimation, but it's all factual. You can... There's something to go back to. There's something that is an immovable object. It's there. Everyone can see it. Mm -hmm. It's not an opinion. I can say, oh, I think the sky's bright pink. Well, T is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
that's an opinion. Mm. I can say tomorrow's going to be Friday. In Australia, tomorrow's going to be Friday. That's factual. Mm. Yeah. Actually, I have a follow-up question on that one. Like, what if a department that is, like, focused on revenue where they can actually bring in a number, like saying this client is going to bring in $80,000 or whatever number of dollars in, how do you compare to that in terms of like, like going against that, like having a client where like, we're going to do it in this way and we don't, we're not going to care too much about design. We're just going to get it out as fast as possible and just do whatever they want and we and win that deal. But me on this end, like trying to advocate for like design, like how, how would you suggest like um, to, to go like, yeah. Yeah. That, Felix, that's a great question. What I'd, what I'd say to that is if, and again, it depends the maturity level of the organization. Like I said, with there's a link to it in the notes, uh, the new, the new design frontier by Bear design. It shows you the maturity level. So within that, it looks at the emotional intelligence of companies as well. It's just a case of, everyone's has well, I think most people have been somewhere where there's a hippo it's like my idea I'm the highest paid person highest paid person in the room you do this my way okay all fair well and good what you can do and again it depends what your appetite is and what your passion is is you can say okay if that's your rationale how about way be how about we a b test it I've been in situations where that has happened where it's a case of okay the business wants to go this way what are you basing it on? Are you basing it on previous customer behavior? Are you, are you, are you basing it on previous, um, on previous records? Because again, you, you need to be looking forward. So you need to be looking towards, towards that, um, towards that uh, North Star, I'd say. So into this, into this question, I'd say, is there the possibility to do A-B testing? Because we've spoken to, or even do it, Again, when I say just do it, if you've got the facility or if you've got the ability to do, to do this, go and talk to customers, do surveys. Obviously, you've got to talk to the right customers. So don't go out there and just start talking to people in the middle of the street. Talk to your customer base. Talk, if they've got this wonderful idea, if the business has got this wonderful idea, they've obviously looked at it in, in, by segmentation or by demographics. Where, where is this pool coming from? What, what is their desire to push forward with this? Um, but like I said, with what we do, it's all evidence-based, or it should be evidence-based. So we can go back to the business and say, okay, you're a firm believer in doing this Spotify example of having this 14-day free trial, and then after 14 days, it automatically, because you still got to put your, um, your payment details in there, it will automatically start taking money out. Okay, let's do that version and see how many people sign up. Another way to do it would be having additional messaging throughout that campaign to say, oh, hey, and just like little gentle nudges. And this is what well, I haven't gone into the talk because this is around UX and being customer centric and um, human centered design is you have gentle nudges to say, oh, hey, you've got seven days to um, sign up for your free account, listen ad free, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then say, okay, here's our hypothesis. Let's get an A-B test out fate, um, and see which one works. You may get the barrier of the business saying, oh, hey, we haven't got enough development time for that to throw resources at it because we need to do it this way. But what you can still do in the background, like I say, reach out, talk, talk to customers. They look at analytics, see if people, and even put a, uh, like a customer satisfaction rate on, on the site or have a, um, have a functionality where, like say for instance, Hotjar, you can, and again, I know these are paid services, um, you can put something on Hotjar to say, oh, did you find what you're looking for today? What's your satisfaction rate? So, put it this way, customers will tell you if something works or not. And believe me, one thing businesses do not like is seeing um, not enough growth and seeing where customers would have bought something, but because of a marketing decision or a sales decision, they don't go through with it. Got you, got you. Thank you so much for that, yeah. yeah. 
actually that, um my follow-up question there like it's something that um kind of going through right now as well but let's not get into that um next up Excellent. let's yeah. sorry felix if, if you want to take um we can have another conversation if, i know for the sake of ndas and stuff but yeah. if you want to just spitball about it mm -hmm. you can delete where applicable or insert another name because mm -hmm. sort of problem you have you're not the only person with it so yeah. if you want to um, share we can, we can talk and i i can give you my answer to the best of my knowledge awesome we'll or take what? this offline sorry yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah take this offline awesome <laughs> offline. awesome um just being conscious of time here um um probably we'll just take one more question here um oh sorry so, before, before before that have we got any answers to that to that question the 300 million dollar question well we actually got a comment here so it was like um your question was more around with like most of the answers that responded is in per percentage and like yeah uh, they, they weren't sure like they were actually gonna put in like a number figure okay so like yeah what, I, what i'd say um I, like i said i still want to give that um credit away we can think mm -hmm. of a question tuck it into um actually because <laughs> that was jared spool right um mm -hmm. be a question around jared spool um what's the company jared spool works for <laughs> whoever is the first person to come back with that gets the um gets the audible credit Cool, cool, cool. Just to reiterate, the question is, what company does Jared Spool work for? The first person yeah. to answer okay. it. Jared Spool's company, more, than, more uh, to be precise. Yeah, what is Jared Spool's company? Okay, I'm um, just like, you guys can see my screen share. I'm going to Google it right yeah, now. Yeah, dude, go on, man. <laughs> Add it in the chat. Add it in the Zoom chat. <laughs> All right, Christina, someone already answered that. Wait, did someone already answer that? Come on, we're still waiting on. Sophia Woods, she said ThoughtWorks. Oh, sponsored oh. him. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. Uh, no. But I think, yeah, so maybe ThoughtWorks sponsored them um, mm -hmm. at one point, but he works at a different company. Yeah. I know this. So. <laughs> I, I know I this actually, too. I can't. I can't. I've actually, I've actually said it in, in the talk a couple of times. So. Mm -hmm. It's it might be difficult to find out. <laughs> you guys Are can we... Google Google it quickly and pop it in the chat. You'll get some free Audible credits. I love yeah. Audible, by the way. I I love Audible. Are we talking about that um training school that he founded? Is that the company? Yes. Uh, okay, cool. Yep. Anyone? No one. Someone would like some Audible credits. No? Well, wow, doesn't anyone want to listen to stuff? <laughs> All righty. Um, I guess we'll, we'll move on then. Center, center, Ray J. Maker of awesomeness. I believe it's center, center, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, okay. yeah, so Jared Spall has this other organization called the Leader of Awesomeness. I've actually I joined it a couple of months ago, and I would advise, I would encourage you all UX practitioners um, to, to join up. There's some really good talks, mm -hmm. some really good content, some good articles. However, when he does his live streams, for us in Australia, it, the time isn't very kind because they're mm -hmm. about what, 2 or 3 a.m. And mm -hmm. I'm not getting up at that time. But also they're recorded. So um, I've, I've watched um, the last couple and they're, they're really informative. Mm -hmm. Awesome stuff. So, Ray J will reach out to you after a session for that audible credit. Thank you so much, Thomas. There. Um, all right. Do you feel like one more question, or we'll just yeah, hang we, around? Yeah. Here? Cool, cool, cool. Let's do this. All right. Um, I found this real pretty interesting here. ROI for design in terms of design system or design ops. What would you suggest? one do to advocate investment in these areas so yeah 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, that's, that's two separate entities as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think with this one, you need to pick your battles. I would say look at the one that needs the most help. Mm-hmm. Um, and without sounding really, really vague and not answering the question directly, I, if, if I'm looking at a problem to solve, I am trying to find out more about what the problem is, what's the diagnosis for that problem. So mm-hmm. if you think a design system is broken or there isn't one there, who's going to benefit from, from it? Say, for instance, if it's a, it's a brand and it's a large-scale organization and mm-hmm. the devs don't talk to the design team, they don't talk to producers, and it's this whole fragment of ex- experience, to get everyone on board, design, design system is definitely the way to go. But also with, the, with a design system, it's not just the UX team, design team that benefits mm-hmm. from them, it's the whole organization. Yeah, and you're, yeah. not just limiting, you're not just limiting it to onto digital as well. You're, you're, talking, off, you're talking off platform, you're talking call centers, you're talking physical products as well. So, yeah, I, I, would, I would say which area do you believe needs the most help in that regard? Mm. And also, yeah. for me, it's a bit difficult to answer that question because I haven't got the detail around it. I need to see what I'm look. I need to see what I'm working with. Mm-hmm. Good one, Derek. Yeah, actually, this that's is a good, also. It's a great question. Yeah, I believe like this. Um, this question would come up for quite a few like designers who are working in enterprises or even in teams. Like, how do you advocate like um, for investment in these kind of these areas, which are still kind of new? But like, there's already quite um, quite a few proven um, um, benefits with these these areas. Like, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. <clears throat> what I'd, what I'd say with this question as well is look at successful companies. How how do they operate? But again, with something like that, when it comes to scale, you may need mm-hmm. to see if it's a if the company you're, you're the, the person's currently working for might be a, uh, a smaller scale company compared to, I don't know, like an Airbnb or a Netflix because their, their UX is, or their UX research is out of control. It's just nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, but see what works for the bigger orgs and to see if there's, I mean, there's obviously there's research around it, but see if there's a way you can get learnings from them, which will resonate with what you're trying to do as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, dear. Um, we'll wrap up that Q&A session right there.